what's up you guys? It's Kenny and welcome to the first episode of Today on Twitter or Today on Twitter. A little play on words for you there. I figured let's start with some good news and work our way from there. So if you don't know who Elijah Daniels is, he's a YouTuber. He used to be buddy buddy with Christine Sildelko. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Tell me if I'm wrong. Fake married, went on the Murray show to do a skit about him cheating on her, the dynamic duo, eventually deciding to split ways in 2017 and he's been doing his own thing ever since. He's also done epic things in favor of the LGBT community and in general making political statements through memeing. He rewrote the Bible to be gay in 2017. In 2018, he became the mayor of Hell, Michigan. Since the town has a shtick that you can be the mayor there for a day or an hour depending on what you choose. And he made the following tweets. I'm gonna become a politician just to see how far I can make it. Like, I could probably get as far as governor. So the other night after I tweeted that, I got high and looked up the easiest political office I could hold. If Donald Trump, a reality star, can be our president, there's no way I can't be a politician. I spent two days calling town asking to let me be their mayor, and guess what? As of today, August 30th, 2017, I'm the legal mayor of Hell, Michigan. This is real. I'm the mayor of hell. As acting mayor of hell, Michigan and I hereby ban all heterosexuals from entering our town. I love straights, but my number one priority is the safety of my town. Until the heterosexual threat has been reviewed, we cannot allow them to enter. Yes, I am the first US mayor to ban heterosexuality, but I hope my act of bravery will inspire fellow politicians to ban straights as well. Although I enjoyed my time as mayor, I've been informed that I've been impeached as mayor of hell. This will not affect my presidential run. Being impeached was fun at Real Donald Trump. You should try it. His banning straight people was essentially mocking Trump's Muslim ban. He upped his game recently and went back to Hell, Michigan and renamed it Gay Hell. Ahead of Pride Month, Trump's administration put a ban on embassies buying pride flags. So, as of today, I am now the owner of Hell, Michigan. I bought the whole town. And my first act as owner, I have renamed my town to Gay Hell, Michigan. The only flags allowed to fly are pride. Gay Hell Michigan has everything. A library, a place to lock your love in gay hell, and even a wedding chapel to get gay married in hell. A lot of people were on board with this, tweeting out jokes about vacationing or even moving there. And I'm glad to know I finally have a solid place to go to after college. Speaking of LGBT, the tag hashtag beautiful LGBT was trending for two days straight, albeit a sponsored hashtag, but definitely lovely to see all the varying people from the LGBT community nonetheless. On to the more depressing news, Alex Jones legitimately sent child porn to the lawyers of the Sandy Hook school shooting. If you don't know who Alex Jones is, it's basically the guy from the I don't like him putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay meme. That's what I personally know him from, at least. I think he does conspiracy theories on YouTube. Not really too sure on that. To quote CT Post, Alex Jones sent child pornography to the lawyers for the families of the Sandy Hook tragedy. The law firm representing the families of the 2012 mass shooting stated in court documents filed Monday, they have contacted the FBI after discovering child porn and electronic files Jones recently turned over to the Sandy Hook families as a result of their lawsuit against him for calling the tragedy a hoax. Jones publicly responded on a broadcast of a show that he's being framed by Chris Matea, the lawyer for the Sandy Hook families, and went on making what Matea and his law firm, Koskoff, Koskoff, and Beter, claim are threats against them. You're trying to set me up with child porn, I'll get your ass, Jones states on the broadcast. One million dollars, you little gang members. One million dollars to put your head on a pike. Jones then pounds a photograph of Matea and goes into a rant at one point stating, I'm gonna kill. Jones' lawyer, Norman Pattis, denied his client was threatening Matea or the Sandy Hook families and urged people to watch the broadcast for themselves. Mr. Jones was upset he did not threaten Mr. Matea. Pattis filed a motion on Monday requesting the lawsuits about his clients to be temporarily halted while investigation is conducted. Jones's lawyers had previously been ordered to turn over vast amounts of electronically stored data on Jones's business operations. Court documents stated that the Sandy Hook lawyers had begun reviewing the electronic files that Jones had turned over and they found child pornography on the files. They immediately contacted the FBI. The FBI advised counsel that its review located numerous additional illegal images, which had apparently been sent to InfoWars email addresses. Kyle Kashev, a survivor of of the Parkland shooting where Nicholas Cruz shot up a high school, killing 17 people and injuring 17, first became well known because of this, eventually going on to speak up in favor of the right to bear arms. Recently, he got rescinded from Harvard after they found his racist remarks. Here's his tweets addressing it. Harvard rescinded my acceptance. Three months after being admitted to Harvard class of 2023, Harvard has decided to rescind my admission over texts and comments made nearly two years ago, months prior to the shooting. 
I have some thoughts. Here's what happened. A few weeks ago, I was made aware of the egregious and callous comments classmates and I made previously years ago when I was 16 years old, months before the shooting, in an attempt to be extreme and as shocking as possible. I immediately apologized. Here's my apology. I have recently been made aware of screenshots circulating that include offensive comments former classmates and I made a few years ago long before the shooting. I want to address this with honesty and transparency. We were 16 year olds making idiotic comments using callous and inflammatory language in an effort to be extreme and as shocking as possible. I'm embarrassed by it, but I want to be clear that the comments I made are not indicative of who I am or who I've become in the years since. This past year has forced me to mature and grow up in an incredibly drastic way. My world, like everyone else's in Parkland, was turned upside down on February 14th. When your classmates, your teachers, and your neighbors are killed, it transforms you as a human being. I see the world through different eyes and am embarrassed by the petty, flippant kid represented in those screenshots. I believe those I've gotten to know since know that I'm a better person than that. I can and will do better moving forward. After I issued this apology, speculative articles were written. My peers used the opportunity to attack me and my life was once again reduced to a headline. It sent me into one of the darkest spirals of my life. After the story broke, former peers and political opponents began contacting Harvard, urging them to rescind me. Harvard then sent this letter stating that Harvard quote-unquote reserved the right to withdraw an offer of admission and requested a written explanation within 42 hours. Dear Mr. Kashev, we have become aware of media reports discussing offensive statements allegedly authored by you. As you know, Harvard reserves the right to withdraw an offer of admission under various conditions, including if you engage or have engaged in behavior that brings into question your honesty, maturity, or moral character. On behalf of the admissions committee, we write now to ask you to send us a full accounting of any such statements you have authored, including not only those discussed in the media, but any others as well. Please also provide a written explanation of your actions to the committee's consideration. Please email these materials to us by no later than 10 a.m. Tuesday, May 28th. Sincerely, William R. Fitzsimmons. I responded to the letter with a full explanation, apology, and requested documents. Dear Mr. Fitzsimmons, Thank you for the opportunity to elaborate on what has been a very difficult and painfully public controversy, which has left me with a feeling of deep regret over an episode I had long forgotten. Let me first state that I apologize unequivocally for my comments, which were made two years ago in private among equally immature high school students. In the attached document, I have attached all comments I have been able to record. I do not have access to the electronic record of that conversation and do not recall other things that may have been said. I have only seen what appeared in the media. I take full responsibility for the idiotic and hurtful things I wrote two years ago. I make absolutely no excuse for those comments. I said them, I regret them, and by explaining the context and my subsequent experiences, I'm not trying to excuse them. Instead, I am seeking to demonstrate the hurtful things I said do not represent the man I am today. I understand Harvard's concerns over the offensive statements from my past, and I further understand that Harvard has been contacted about them by people expressing concerns about them. I am very sorry to have to put the college in this position. I am determined to take whatever steps are necessary to rectify this past wrong and to reassure Harvard of my commitment to values of tolerance, diversity, and inclusion which I hope to advance as a member of the class of 2024. This is the context in which I made these comments. While this does not excuse my comments, I made poor choices with regards to the people I surrounded myself with. I became part of a group in which those words bore little weight and were used only in a means for their shock value. I bore no racial animus. The context was a group of adolescents trying to use the worst words and say the most insane things imaginable. Until these writings were disclosed, I had long forgotten about them. While I will forever bear incredible shame for typing them, I especially feel remorse now that they have made public, knowing they have caused terrible pain to people I care about. I gave no consideration to the meaning and weight of the words I wrote in an effect to impress then friends and classmates. And looking back, I know clearly know I wrote terrible things I can never unwrite. My intent was never to hurt anyone, and to do so would have magnified the harm immensely. I also feel I am no longer the same person, especially with the aftermath of the Parkland shooting and all that has transpired since.
I had to mature and not only to address that horrible situation, but to fulfill my new role as a school safety activist. I have tried hard to be a better man in honor of the friends I lost, and I believe I have grown and matured significantly through the experience. I am proud of some of the things I have accomplished in the wake of this tragedy, and I do not recognize the person who wrote those things. When I was reminded of the writings, I was mortified and embarrassed. My parents raised me to be better than what is represented in these screenshots from about two years ago. In an effort to be honest and as transparent as possible, I immediately apologized publicly when reminded of those messages, while knowing the media uproar that would ensue, it did ensue, and I have continued to accept responsibility and the resulting legitimate criticism. As you know, I intend to take a gap year before beginning my studies to continue my work promoting school safety. I will continue to mature and will enter Harvard with three years and many life experiences between the foolish child who said those things and the man I am today. As an aspiring member of the Harvard community, I aspire to the values that the community strives to uphold. Hold. Therefore, I have already written to the Harvard College Office of Diversity, Education, and Support both to express my deepest apologies and remorse and to reach out to begin a dialogue that I hope will be the foundation of future growth. While I am no longer the same person who wrote those comments, there is always more to learn, especially about the legacy of racism in our society. Thank you again for this opportunity to address these issues. I hope this has fully addressed your concerns, but if not, I would be happy to provide any further information or discussion you require. Sincerely, Kyle Kashev. Harvard decided to rescind my admission with the following letter. Dear Mr. Kashev, thank you for your response to our letter of May 24th. The admissions committee has discussed at length your account of the communication about which we asked, and we appreciate your candor and your expressions of regret for sending them. As you know, the committee takes seriously the qualities of maturity and moral character. After careful consideration, the committee voted to rescind your admission to Harvard College. We are sorry about the circumstances that have led us to withdraw your admission, and we wish for your success in your future academic endeavors and beyond. Yours sincerely, William R. Fitzsimmons. I also sent this email to the Office of Diversity to Harvard College of Diversity, Education, and Support. Around two years ago, when I was 16 years old, before the mass shooting that occurred at my high school, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, I was part of a group in which we used abhorrent racial slurs. We did so out of a misplaced sense of humor. We treated the words themselves as though they bore little weight, and used them only for their shock value. Looking back two years later, I cannot recognize that person. I make absolutely no excuses for those comments. I said them, and I regret them deeply. I bore no racial animus whatsoever. The context was a group of adolescents trying to use the worst words and say the most insane things imaginable. My intent was never to hurt anyone. I do not have access to the electronic record of that conversation, and do not recall things that may have been said. I have only seen what has appeared in the media. When reminded of these comments, I immediately apologized publicly, knowing there would be an immediate media uproar, given that I have become a public figure over the past year. That uproar did ensue, and I have continued to accept responsibility for my comments, and I accept fully the resulting legitimate criticism. I am entirely embarrassed and do not recognize the person who wrote those things. As you may know, I have already intended to take up year to continue my school safety activism before beginning my studies in the fall of 2020. I will hope to enter Harvard as a more mature member of the community with three years and many life experiences between the foolish child who said those things two years ago and the man I am today and wish to become in the future. I am deeply sorry for my past comments. I know I am not the same person. But I realize there's always more I can do to understand and learn about the struggle and pain of minority communities in America and worldwide. During my gap year, I will supplement my activism to include reaching out to minority communities. I am open to any advice or suggestions on activities I might pursue during my gap year in pursuit of that goal. I am committing to engaging on that issue, and I plan to visit your office when I arrive at Harvard in the fall of 2020 after I complete my gap year. Sincerely, Kyle Kashev. Somewhat ironically, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion sent me this response rewarding my apology. Hello, Kyle. I hope this message finds you well. Thank you for your email. We appreciate you thoughtful reflections and look forward to connecting with you upon your matriculation in the fall of 2020. In the interim, I encourage you to search offline for different ways to connect to local organizations and resources within your community. Have a wonderful day! Best Grace. After receiving Harvard's letter revoking my acceptance, I responded by asking for the opportunity to have an in-person meeting 
to make my case face to face and work towards any possible path of reconciliation. Harvard responded by declining my meeting request. Dear Mr. Fitzsimmons, thank you for your letter dated June 3rd, 2019. I'm writing today to see if it would be at all possible to meet to discuss the matter in person. As I mentioned in my previous correspondence, I have been in communication with Harvard Diversity Office, Office of Diversity, Education, and Support. I reached out to them proactively because I wanted to apologize and to seek help in continuing to mature and move forward. I indicated that I looked forward to, to working with the office when I arrived on campus and asked for advice in connecting to local community organizers during the gap year I had entirely planned to take. They warmly received my apology and sent me this in response. Dear Mr. Kashif, thank you for your correspondence. We understand the outcome is disappointing, but please be aware that the admissions committee carefully and thoroughly considered your application in reciting its determination. Decisions of the admission committee are final. We wish you the best of luck in all of your future endeavors. Sincerely, William R. Fitzsimmons. Harvard deciding that someone can't grow, especially after a life-altering event like a shooting, is deeply concerning. If any institution should understand growth, it's Harvard, which is looked to as the pinnacle of higher education despite its checkered past. Throughout history, Harvard's faculty has included slave owners, segregationists, bigots, and anti-Semites. If Harvard is suggesting that growth is impossible and that our past defines our future, then Harvard is an inherently racist institution. But I don't believe that. I believe that institutions and people can grow. I've said that repeatedly. In the end, this isn't about me. It's about whether we live in a society in which forgiveness is possible or mistakes brand you as irredeemable, as Harvard has decided for me. So what now? I'm figuring it out. I have given up huge scholarships in order to go to Harvard, and the deadline for accepting other college offers has ended. I'm exploring all options at the moment. Ending off March 17th, The Bachelorette trended, and everyone was pissed at Luke P. Not gonna lie to you, I don't watch The Bachelorette, but from all the stuff I was looking at in that section, it definitely seems like an interesting choice. If anyone watches it and, and wants to fill me in on what's going on there in the comments below, that'd definitely be sick. Starting off March 18th, some things about basketball and Clooney trended, Ed Sheeran's releasing his fourth album called Numbers Collaboration Project, which will be including Bruno Mars, Camila Cabello, Travis Scott, Her, Meek Mill, Skrillex, Cardi B, and Khaled. Personally, I don't listen to a lot of modern music because I like to rub in the fact that I'm a hipster to everyone I know, so I only know half the people listed. But out of those, come on dude, Cardi B, really? I know you've got to keep up audience retention and fame or whatever excuse you have, but not something I would have done when she admitted to drugging and stealing money from men. A screenwriter and director who's been accused of sexual harassment in the past had eight women come out about their sexual, physical, and mental abuse at his hands. I'm gonna read parts of the Daily Beast that I don't think show bias and basically summarize most of what's been going on and what he did up until this point. Netflix official Twitter account sent out a tweet promoting the premiere of Bright, something that Landis was a huge part of the project on set to debut that day. Anna Akana responded to the tweet writing, written by a psychopath who sexually abused and assaults women, right? Cool. This tweet led others on Twitter to accuse Landis of sexual misconduct, including Zoe Quinn, a prominent game developer and artist who wrote the following Twitter thread. Sometimes men who commit sexual assault are talented screenwriters and their work comes with baggage. Other times, they're Max Landis. Folks were mad that a Pepe Le Pew movie was being made because who needs a movie about a rapist skunk? But at least it meant Max Landis could switch from cringe fiction to finally writing his autobiography and writing what he knows. It probably has been an open secret for so long because it's hard to talk about the seriously fucked up shit he's done when you say his name and everyone within earshot has to seek medical care from reflexively rolling their eyes so hard they sprain. You can't control it. I've been holding on to the shit for years as more friends have accrued Max Landis stories. Because it wasn't my place, and him and his dad are powerful figures, so naturally going against that is terrifying for survivors, so I'm so glad people are finding out what a piece of shit he is. I hope each one of his teeth break individually. My last encounter with him was watching him tell my friend on the night that her ex beat her up that since she's gotten abused before, she should figure out what she's doing to cause all that drama for herself and not reach out to friends about it on social media. I hope this means I don't have to avoid more cool parties that I know he's been invited to because life is too short to deal with someone who's like if a gross uncle and cocaine had a baby and the baby was also a rapist. Talk about 
Landis's alleged history of sexual misconduct has been floating around the industry circle for quite some time. And back in early November, Mad Magazine editor Ali Gortz sent out a tweet that read, I can't imagine who is more scared in a post-Weinstein world than a famous director's son. The tweet, according to several people, was familiar, reminding them of Landis, and the thread prompted a reply from Makana writing, Believe you, support you. Earlier this week, Jake Wiseman, creator of the upcoming Comedy Central series Corporate, composed a tweet that appeared to be directed at Landis. Definitely watch that big Netflix movie coming out, written by that fucking psychopath who's one of the worst people alive. Mike Drucker, a writer for The President Show, replied to it with, Jake, I have exactly, entirely, 100% no idea of whom you're talking about, but... I just hope he doesn't have a powerful father in Hollywood who's covering up for the fucked up shit he's done. Former BBC host and sketch comedy writer Siobhan Thompson then responded to Drucker's tweet, writing, I don't know who you mean, but if that's true, I bet I have SEVERAL friends who have been sexually assaulted by him. Landis also has a history of making outrageously problematic statements. For example, in an interview, Landis expounded on an ex he says he gave a crippling social anxiety, self-loathing, body dysmorphia, eating disorder to. I mean, you can't really give someone any of these things. But the seeds of these things were inside of her. We were in this sort of unfair, fucked up relationship. Not the kind where there's a lot of yelling and screaming. The actual relationship was very nice and loving, but I was so fickle about her body. I'm not shy, I would just blurt out shit all the time. She ended up completely changing how she dressed and how she looked for me. That chick will never talk to me again. Annie Baker, an ex of Max Landis, was upset when she realized that Landis still had videos of her posted in the highlight section of Instagram despite the fact that she had broken up with him months ago and demanded no contact. She figured that new vulnerable women just entering Landis' life would quickly find her page, causing her to write a warning on social media. If you have found my page via Max Landis, hi, Baker wrote, I'm going to give you some direct info I wish I had gotten because the experience slash aftermath of this person is really destructive and it will be riddled with pain and emotional work that you don't need to spend your precious energy on. Akana, who continued to to speak out publicly about Landis so that she first started hearing terrible things about the screenwriter when they were still friends years ago. And then after I went public, there were more people who came to me. She estimated that she had heard a little less than a dozen, maybe like 10 or so, first-hand allegations of sexual misconduct in total. As for second-hand allegations, there were too many to count. There's too many voices to ignore, Akana said, and I felt the need to be vocal because Max is intimidating and he's scary. And I've seen, being in that friend group, one of the most frustrating things is he would lord his power and his money over people and intimidate them into friendship or into forgiveness. He trusted that we would not never say anything, worked actively to discredit people who were saying things, and was just as consistently in the abuse as he was with covering it up and manipulating us afterwards. Julie, an ex-girlfriend and former friend of Landis, explained, I didn't realize that I'd been raped consistently and deliberately by this man for two years until today when I wrote it down. Even up until the end of last year, I told Max that after everything, I still believed he was a good person and that he was trying. In short, the reason I let him back into my life was his subsequent relationships, the incredible, smart, nurturing, and empathetic woman he conned into a relationship after me seemed to vouch for his improvement, and I thought, if these women believe in him, he must have learned. Just by association, he seemed like a better person. Lainey, a former friend of Landis, whose stint in the Color Society overlapped with Julie's, had a similar introduction to the circle. Max was one of the first people I met when I moved to Los Angeles. He had amassed this huge group of really cool people that he would get together for ridiculous activities, 100-person nerf battles, and elaborate theme parties which he usually spent 50k on. As someone who grew up with just a small group of close friends, the idea of feeling part of this crazy, creative, weird, and charismatic community was really appealing. It gave me the sense of belonging I'd always craved. Multiple ex-members compared aspects of the group dynamic to a cult. I think he really does operate sort of as a cult leader, Samantha, a former friend who also briefly dated Landis, said. Here's someone with a lot of resources and power and glamour, and he's surrounding himself with people, basically kids who just moved to LA from who knows where, who don't have a network. He swoops in and, like a predator, 
He knows how to hook a person. Multiple women who dated Landis described similar experiences of being relentlessly pursued and eventually dragged into his orbit, first as friends and then as something more. My initial impression of him was he's trouble, explained Samantha, who met Landis in college at the University of Miami. He just sort of wears you down. He's that persistent. He sees something shiny and he wants it. He would systematically try to have sex with all the women I knew. We're not people to him. Julie's romantic relationship with Landis lasted for two years years. Like Samantha, she recalled being relentlessly pursued by Matt. He jokingly called me a paint cat, in reference to the ill-fated feline who tries desperately to escape the clutches of Pepe Le Pew, Julie wrote in her statement. I was showered with affection, new friends, parties, and intense I love yous. Julie described the spectrum of abuse that she experienced during their relationship as the following. Landis would bring up his hand and fake that he was going to hit me, and laugh when I flinched. He'd constantly threaten to break up with me, speak about his prospects to me, and openly flirt in front of me. On multiple occasions, he'd refer to me as his ex-girlfriend in front of girls at parties we'd go to together as a couple. He'd openly critique my body in front of people and tell me privately that I had the potential to be so hot if I committed to working out more. He'd graphically describe sex with his ex-girlfriends and rate their abilities compared to mine, both to me and to his friends and work associates. Lainey recalled witnessing this kind of behavior on multiple occasions. Things like introducing Julie as his ex-girlfriend and calling her fat when she walked away to go get a drink. Samantha also observed the way that Land spoke to both Julie and Danny Manning, a previous ex-girlfriend. It was abusive, she said. He would manipulate them, body shame them, and was just generally cruel. What Landis's extended friend group wasn't able to see was the sexual violence that happened behind closed doors to Julie, which she says was a part of their relationship from the very beginning. He showed me abuse and humiliation porn and constantly tested my boundaries. This became murkier and murkier as our relationship got more tumultuous, as I grew to view sex with him as the only way to receive love and connection. This led to me allowing myself to become more and more abused. He claimed that seeing me cry was a turn-on. This later turned into a routine of him yelling and humiliating me until I cried, then having sex with me while I continued to cry with no regard or effort to make it right. He'd instigate fights, belittle and upset me, just so he could have sex with me, and the real legitimate fights ended the same way. He choked me until I passed out and did humiliating, degrading things to me that I still can't manage to write out on paper. He continues to violate my boundaries into even after our relationship, and if any of this still feels like a blurred line scenario, let me assure you that he did hold me down and rape when I said no over and over. Afterwards, I punched him in the shoulder and I told him, when someone says no, you're supposed to stop. What you did is what they call rape. He said he thought we were just playing a game and that I liked it. Julie only recently disclosed this to her two sisters, who both recalled picking up on red flags from the very start. Her oldest sister recalled an incident in which Julie called her crying after a big fight when he jumped on the hood of her car. I'd seen pictures and noticed she was losing weight. She said her self-confidence was plunging and she stopped sharing it with us. Towards the end of their relationship was a really negative time for us as sisters because I didn't really know what was happening in her life. And then once she stopped dating him, that completely changed, which was pretty crazy to see that 180 happen. I just got the sense that he's this very controlling guy, Julie's other sister said. He definitely used to try to drive a wedge between us. Julie was like, Max thinks that you guys are so different from me, and that's why I felt left out between the three of us for so many years. He almost convinced her of problems within the family. Max Landis is a serial rapist, gaslighter, physical and physiological abuser who tormented me for six years long after our romantic relationship, both directly and behind my back, Julie wrote in her statement. In a 2016 email to Max Landis, Julie summarized much of the alleged physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, including the jumping on my car incident and the night where I said no multiple times, then punched you in the shoulder after and said, someone says no, they mean no, and you laughed it off. Landis responded to the email, well, this all sounds horrible. When Julie and Landis first met. A vibrant social life was part of Landis's appeal. During their romantic relationship and after it ended, it was a weapon he used against her. Friendship has always been currency to Landis, Julie explained. He'd isolate me from friends, make sure I wasn't invited to things, tell them terrible things about me, 
even after we dated, after I found forgiveness for him, discredited any person who criticized him, and started smear campaigns on pretty much every person who has ever been his friend. Julie said that recent conversations she's had with Baker and Carrie, another ex-girlfriend of Landis, caused her to further reassess her relationship with him. Her continued friendship with Landis, which lasted for years after they broke up, was built on the foundational myth that he was getting better, better with Carrie than he was with me, better with Annie than he was with Carrie, and then it became clear that he had continued to hurt women in the same way that he hurt me. He never got better. He only learned to say the right things. Now I understand that he won't get better, and he's a dangerous person, and everything that I thought about him trying and him improving was just an act. Julie's still coming to terms with how much Landis hid behind his friends and surrounded himself purposely with good people, and how much guilt I felt over the fact that I may have made it seem like he was safe just by being around him and just by lending my presence to his friend group. He used all of us. As the founder and the leader of the Color Society, Landis was able to lavish his friends while also keeping them in line. Every Halloween, he'd pick out his 10 favorite people of the moment, rent a limousine, and take them celebrity party hopping, Laney recalled. Then, the next year, half those people weren't deemed worthy anymore and were replaced. He'd also hold annual burning Mac trips to Big Bear or Idlewild, where it was the same deal. No matter the occasion, he'd encourage people to talk shit about the people who weren't there, create rifts he could manipulate later for fun, or get information he could use. It was both incredibly juvenile and a cleverly megnomaniacal way to keep people in line. Everyone wants to feel special, and he did that while also tearing you to shred. The group was constantly in flux, with ex-members recalling the frequent, unexplained disappearance of key players. People would leave in waves, Laney said. Multiple sources confirmed a pattern in which a friend or a recent ex-girlfriend of Landis would disappear from the social scene, and Max would immediately speak ill of them. Brad Gage, who was one of Landis' best friends for almost a decade, recalled, he would have these people in his life and he would torment them so much, where they would literally cut him out completely, and it was such a foreign idea to me, but now I understand. They were smart. He portrayed them as crazy, but of course there were ones who knew that they needed to just completely excise him from their life. Friends who cut Landis out recalled his efforts to bring them back into the fold. Over their roughly four-year relationship, Laney said that Landis bullied and emotionally abused her, on top of making fat-shaming comments at her expense. Landis allegedly engaged in physiological toying, as in, I'm gonna give you attention and tell you you're great, and then I'm gonna ignore you for five weeks like he did something wrong. And then I'm gonna give you a little bit more intention. She noted, he did that with a lot of people. Lainey also recalled an instance in which she went to the bathroom and threw up because she didn't know she was going to be seeing Landis. I couldn't stop shaking. He was always vicious, but everyone would say, oh, that's just how Max is. He's a jerk. He knows it. He calls himself out on it. There was that conflation of self-awareness with meaningful change. In my opinion, some of the worst people in the world are those who openly admit they're terrible. Using that proclamation as a get-out-of-jail-free card, they think, well, you were warned. As Lainey extracted herself from the group, Landis would occasionally call her and ask her to come back. Because the closer you keep the people you hurt, the less likely they are to have enough distance to realize what happened. When Anna Akana first called out Landis on social media in 2017, Lainey received a call from him, which she categorized as damage control. He called me to apologize, and in the very same breath, said he didn't remember what he did to me. He says, I don't know what I'm apologizing for, but I'm very sorry if I ever made you feel bad. It was surreal. I was friends with Julie when she dated Max, and you could see her losing weight and witness him going after other women while he was with her to keep her on her toes, Danny Manning recalled. And the same thing happened to Carrie. Carrie wrote that Landis picked on me constantly. He'd say, you don't do hot girls well, or you should do whatever she does to work out, while pointing at some other woman's body. He'd compliment me for not eating. He bought me workout classes to shape me the way he wanted. I lost 15 pounds while we were together, and even though he'd bring up openly that he'd given an ex-girlfriend an eating disorder, I somehow didn't identify what was happening to me as that. Throughout three years that Landis was in her life, Baker found herself taking on the roles of teacher, PR person, and therapist. She was entirely dedicated to the project of Landis self improvement he opened with, Yeah, I used to be terrible, but I've changed so much, and I want to keep changing. After a period of dating while seeing other people, Landis took Baker out of lunch and told her that he wanted to commit to her and become a new person, really, for real. His life had already started to implode, Baker explained, and longtime friends like Gage had cut him out for good. I said, Okay. And he walked me to my car and he kissed me. And he said, I kind of want to get you a personal trainer. Abuse is slippery. No one starts out announcing they're abusive. You discover it slowly, Harry wrote in her statement. But Max did, somewhat, announce that he was abusive. 
That was also so disarming about the particular brand of manipulation. Max also quickly lets you know that he's sick, with a form of bipolar disorder, and this was tied to the ways in which he was abusive. It was even harder to see clearly. It caused me to often misfile his abusive behaviors as sad indicators of his illness, and as a result, I would often wind up comforting him in regards to his own rem remorse over his actions. Once he choked me and told me he wanted to kill me, and I would wind up reassuring him that he wasn't a monster when he felt bad about that, because I felt bad that he was so sick. Manning, who started dating Landis around 2007, has blocked most of that time out. It was a long time ago, and I know there are other things that I just cannot bring forward and do not want to come into my mind. Manning wrote down in a statement, The emotional abuse took control over me to the point where I got down to 115 pounds at 5'10", still not skinny enough. He'd smack food out of my hand in front of his family to stop me from eating it. He told me that if I worked out more, I'd be supermodel pretty, except I was not pretty, and I would be told why, in detail, which body parts and facial features. I'd get insulted if the outfit I wore didn't look sexy enough or made my body look bad. She added, there was no option of not having sex if Max wanted to, and you did not. The first incident that I can remember, we were at some public event, and I think I laughed at something, and he just started choking me to the point where my eyes were blacking out. I felt such confusion that I tried to leave, and I was drunk, and I just had to kind of wait while he tried to convince me that he didn't mean it. I remember going roller skating with Max. He was not good at roller skating. And I laughed. I was knocked to the ground. He threw the plate of food he'd been holding in my face. Even after Manning broke up with Landis, he remained an oversized presence in her life. It felt like everywhere I wasn't safe because he would be there, and all the places I loved, he would be there. There was no escaping him, so I kind of just gave up. Because if I wanted to stay away from him, I would have to cut off all my friends, and I wasn't strong enough to do that. Like other women, Manning received a call from the screenwriter when the public allegations began. He called me crying and saying, I'm sorry for everything I ever did to you, but I don't know how many people got that call. Like many others, Manning told the Daily Beast that Landis's abuse followed an increasingly predictable pattern. He does the same thing to every woman, she explained. You're always not quite good enough, and there's always a woman who he's dated before you and he's done all the same things to her. His excuse is that he sees his own faults and acknowledges what he did to these women. Meanwhile, he's doing all of the same things to you. I just remember he was so honest about the way he treated women he dated in college saying, I gave her this eating disorder and I cheated on her a million times and at the same time, he was already making comments about my weight. Gage, who first became friends with Landis at the University of Miami in 2007, said that Landis had a whole history of transforming these incredible, vibrant women into this type of woman that he was looking for. All of them go blonde, all of them lose weight, and all of them are under his spell. A heavily redacted legal document shows that Max Landis was involved in a September 2008 Miami Circuit Court case. Domestic Violence Division, Callie Ray, the woman listed on the documents, confirmed that she made the 2008 sexual assault allegation against Landis and eventually dropped the case. She directed the conversation to her close friend, Ashley Hefting Dion, who witnessed her alleged sexual abuse by Landis. In a written statement, Dion recalled that Callie had told her she was going out for drinks that night with a group of friends, including Max Landis. Later that night, Dion wrote, I was asleep and awoke to what sounded like a person falling, and then I heard what sounded like another person picking up someone and setting them down. I then heard more sounds of motion, then I heard Callie's voice ask an accused in a quiet voice for her then-boyfriend's name, and then repeat the name she called her boyfriend, still sounding confused and delirious. I then heard a male voice confirming that he was her boyfriend. Knowing her boyfriend was out of town at the time, I jumped out of my bed and walked into our shared living room to see Max over Callie on our couch. He was on top of her and her pants were off and he was thrusting and I could hear the sounds of what he was doing. I yelled, you need to leave right now. He got up, quickly pulling his pants up and I physically rushed him, aggressively demanding he leave immediately. Standing now in the carport, I yelled at him that what he was doing was wrong and it was not okay and he needed to leave right now. He started to get highly emotional and was crying, saying he knew it was wrong and he was sorry. It seemed as though he was hoping to be comforted in that moment. I went back inside to check on my friend. She was crying and confused and in and out of consciousness. The next morning, Diane asked her friend if she could remember anything from the previous night. She could not remember much, but woke up feeling physically ill and profoundly sad. She recalls she had been out having drinks with a group of friends that included Max. She could remember being out drinking, but couldn't remember much more than that. I told Callie what I witnessed and that I thought it was a serious violation to her and a crime. After talking
talking through it, we decided to go to the police station to file a report that morning. I drove her to the station, and we both gave a statement and filed a police report. Shortly after they filed the report, Diane accompanied Callie and her mother to the courthouse for a hearing. As they were sitting in the waiting room of the court, Diane recalled Max's attorney approaching them. She began speaking, and her tone was condescending and aggressive, asking if Callie understood what the process would be like. She indicated it would be long, and she would have to talk about the assault over and over. The attorney came up patronizing as she said things like, I will make you look like an idiot, and this is not going to be easy on you. The attorney said she was going to make a fool of Callie, talking about how much she drinks and talking about the nature of her relationship to Max. She then asked if this was how Callie wanted to handle this issue. I could feel that Callie was overwhelmed. Callie sat there, tears running down her face, holding hands with her mother and with me. Callie said she did not want to go through with this process. I think if I had not been home to hear Max violate my friend, she would not have known what happened to her. I had hoped that us confronting him would mean that he would not do it again. She had always characterized and viewed their friendship to be platonic, and regardless, what I saw was no gray area. My friend was not in a conscious state, and he lied to her by implying he was her boyfriend. This was rape. Despite an alleged decade-long history of sexual misconduct, it wasn't until this year that a detailed first-hand allegation against Landis first surfaced. The anonymously penned medium post described an incident that allegations occurred during a June 2012 trip to Hicksville Trailer Palace in Joshua Tree with Landis. According to the author of the post, she was intoxicated when Landis first attempted to grab her. After she started to run away, the writer continued, Landis grabbed me and pushed me down onto the bed, with his knees holding my thighs apart and his hands holding down my arms so I couldn't get away. I could feel his mm -hmm, pressing into me through my- and he was pulling up my shirt. He kept trying to kiss me as I was turning my head from side to side, trying to dodge him. I kept saying no. Eventually, the writer wrote that she went limp and pretended to pass out, and Landis got off her. For Annie Baker, the medium post was the final straw. Ever since Anna Akana and the first wave of social media posts, Landis had been terrified of sexual misconduct accusers coming forward, according to Baker. We knew about the story that was possibly going to break, and I said, I want you to tell me about each and every one of these encounters. Have you assaulted or raped anybody? He maintained that he hadn't, and he walked me through each of the situations, like the Joshua Tree story. He told me his version. I tried to hook up with her. She said stop and I did. He knew who the women were that were on record, so he would tell me about each of those accounts, either dismissing them and saying, she's doing this now for a purpose, or saying, actually, I probably was scary to her in that situation. I went to therapy with him about this, where he entered it into a stage of trying to figure out if he could be a rapist. He would say, I've gone through the list in my mind, every single encounter that I've had, and I just have to say I'm not a rapist and he'd be crying. Baker encouraged Landis to hire a new publicist to help him write a statement maintaining he was not sexual assailant, but apologizing to women who he had mistreated or hurt in the past. Baker and Landis spent countless hours going through the stories, his versions of them at least. I said, Max, if I ever learn that you were lying to me about any of these encounters, and there's more to these stories than what you're telling me, if I learn that you've raped someone, if I learn that you've sexually assaulted someone, then I'm not going to be able to handle that. And he would say, I know, I told you everything. There's nothing that I'm not telling you. That will never happen. Reading that Medium article, Baker saw a different version of the story that Landis had relayed to her countless times. I read what actually happened from her perspective and it is aggressive sexual assault. And I immediately emailed or texted him and I said, you lied to me. According to Baker, Veronica was another potential accuser that Landis tried to preemptively discredit. The alleged sexual assault happened while Baker was dating Landis before they began seeing each other exclusively. Veronica first met Landis through mutual friends in 2012. Within minutes of meeting him, he called me retarded for my choice in food and accused another mutual friend of having an eating disorder for her order as well in the same breath. I immediately wrote him off. He was rude, loud, and obnoxious, and I wanted nothing to do with him. And yet I was still curious as to why the majority of my social circle seemed to like him so much. Sensing Veronica's resistance to his friendship, Landis began to love mom her around 2015, constantly telling me how smart and talented he thought I was, and how he was so glad that we were finally becoming friends. As Veronica began to consider Landis a close friend, the disturbing behavior that previously repulsed her was used to pull her even closer.
closer, I began to notice how he treated people who crossed him. He created a group chat with his closest friends where he would essentially character assassinate people he didn't like to us. His character assassinations carried weight. People were iced out of the circle and lost friends and opportunities all over lies he told us. I see all of this now as him openly displaying his power to us and what he could do to us if we dared to challenge him. It was a subtle way of bolstering the loyalty of his base and keeping us in line. In early 2017, Veronica went through a breakup and Landis quickly swooped in. He insisted she go on a date with him. While I wasn't that interested in him romantically, he did make me believe as though I could trust him fully, she explained. He suggested we go to Disneyland and stay overnight. He drove us there and we stayed in a room with two beds. Upon arriving to the hotel room, the first thing he did was physically overpower me. He pinned me to one of the beds face down and began touching my crotch through my leggings. I was shocked. When he saw he had scared me, he laughed and said, that made you uncomfortable comfortable, didn't it? That's when it began to sink in for me that I was physically trapped there with him for the next 24 hours. Referencing the author of the Medium Post, Veronica noted, he took her on a trip physically to another place, drove her there, and then assaulted her there because she couldn't go anywhere and she was tied to him and couldn't get home. And that's exactly what happened to me. Once they left the hotel room for the park, the situation continued to escalate. He tried to put his hand on my pants and up my shirt while we were waiting in line for rides, surrounded by children and family. People began to noticed as I tried to dodge his hands. I was absolutely humiliated. I told him to stop and he didn't. Halfway through the day, it escalated into him loudly shouting at me that he wanted to fuck, so we had to get back to the room. Veronica was embarrassed by Landis's public behavior and recalled, thinking I had to get Max out of there or he would get us kicked out by molesting me openly and screaming about sex. Back in the hotel room, Veronica and Landis had sex, which she described as rough and violent but over relatively quickly. I don't remember much about it, Veronica continued. I was in too much shock over how this date was going with someone I previously had so much trust in. Prior to this, Max and I had had no sexual contact. She begged him to go back to the park where she felt he might be held slightly more accountable for his action. That night at the hotel, Veronica claimed that Landis tried to initiate sex again. I told him I was really uncomfortable with the situation and I didn't want to again. He became enraged and began screaming at me and throwing things in the hotel room around. I shrank to a corner on the far end of the hotel room to put some space between us, and then he loudly complained that I wasn't being a good date. Veronica said, in the morning I awoke to him performing oral sex on me, despite expressing the night before I wasn't interested in sex again. I was frozen in fear, she continued. When he noticed, he said, you know you can ask me to stop, right? I said, oh, I can? Then, yes, please stop. He actually continued for a moment before deciding he was bored. Anna O'Connor said that Veronica texted her when it was going on or right after her discomfort started at Disneyland because he was physically putting his hands in her pants while they were in lines for rides and she was like, back the fuck up, there are children around, this is weird. And he just got super appropriate and then assaulted her at the hotel. She said, I don't want to do this. Veronica also told her friend Ethan about the incident. I saw Veronica at a party and I can't remember how it came up, Ethan said, but she just point blank pulled me into a corner and said, remember that shithole Max that everyone knew was a shithole? Turns out he's a shithole. He sexually assaulted me, and she started to get kind of emotional. I got stuck with him just like everyone else. He took me somewhere where I couldn't leave. I thought it was as a friend, and he sexually assaulted me, and I was scared of him. The phrase, she said, was, everyone's scared of Max. He gets really, really scary when he's upset with you. Once Landis claimed to have committed fully, both to Anna Barker and to his own self-improvement, she was pressured not to bring up his prior actions. At one point earlier in their relationship, Baker had decided she was sick of Landis actively fucking with her emotions and sent him a clear and forceful email explaining that while they could continue to be friends, she could no longer sleep with him. Landis responded that he understood and respected her decision to take sex off the table. The next time they hung out, Baker recalled, Landis drove her home and attempted to initiate sex. I said, I don't want to do this with you anymore. And he said, are you sure? He said, are you sure enough? I'm playing a sex game and I think it's hot that you're saying no. Way. It was like, are you sure? As he's starting to unzip his pants and I said, yes, I'm not doing this with you anymore. I don't want to. And he pulled out his dick, continuing to say, are you sure? And he put his hand around the back of my neck and he started to slowly pull my head towards him and his dick is now out. And I said, I really don't want to do this. He just continued to pull my head slowly until it was in his lap. 
Baker continued. I was still attracted to him. We had had a sexual relationship and he knew that, but it was that I wanted to protect myself and my own emotions. I expressed to him very clearly and he told me that he understood. And he did understand, but he didn't care. So I did it and I got out of the car. And after that, we were just having sex again. There was another incident later on in their relationship, which Landis later claimed not to remember. We finished having sex, and we were standing naked in his kitchen, and I slapped his butt, and he said, don't slap my butt. And I said, no, I'm going to, in a way I thought was playful. And he snapped, is the only way I can describe it. He turned around, and he put his hands around my throat, and he got close to my face, and he said, I will fucking kill you. Do you understand what I'm saying? I will fucking kill you. One of the most emotionally painful things that Landis did occurred early in their romantic relationship. She recalled an incident right after they slept together. When Landis asked if she wanted to see something awful, he opened his computer and showed her a very long list of women's names, all of the women who he had slept with, according to Landis. At the top was a key he made to rank each experience as enjoyable or not, exciting or not, etc. Some of the women were listed by name, just by their ethnicity and location of the encounter, because he didn't know their name. He scrolled to the bottom and showed me my name, with his rankings next to it. When Baker began to cry, Landis looked at her expressionless. He said that he had shown the list to other women, and that they had had the same reaction as Baker, so he didn't know why he kept doing it. This list and the way he went about showing it to the women who were on it was one of the most telling things about the way he viewed women, Baker concluded. He collected experiences with women for his enjoyment and ego and then turned those experiences into pain and devaluation for as many women as he could. Baker claimed that Landis would not let her leave when she attempted to break up with him and believes that Landis clung to her with greater fervor the more he feared for his career following a spat of online allegations. He would constantly say, like when he was really ready to cop to stuff, he would say, Okay, fine. I've made a woman feel used. I've been a shitty guy. But I have never let it bleed into my life work. I've never had sexual relationships with anybody on any set. I've never been inappropriate with anybody on a set. He said, that's not, what a, that's not what kind of monster I am. He said, everyone who's worked with me will say that it was the best experience of their life. When she was an 18-year-old college student, Masha Mandiata had, had an unpaid acting role in, in a student film. Max Landis playing an unspecified role in the production. I'm pretty sure he was just another actor. I'm almost positive that was not his script or his production, Mendiata said. But over a decade later, Landis still holds the distinction of being one of the worst guys on set that I've ever encountered. The title goes to Max Landis for introducing me to sexual harassment in the workplace. Mendieta went on to work as an actress for almost 10 years, but that little role, but that little role on a comedy short film was one of her first parts. She had been cast as a sorority extra in a group of other female actors. When she got to the February 2007 shoot, she was instantly confused, because the name of who was in charge was not Max Landis, but when I showed up, Max was sitting there on the director's chair. Emails from December 2006 listing both Mendiata and Landis as actors on the project. As the shoot progressed, Landis shouted out orders and issued rude, condescending suggestions, according to Mendiata. To her surprise, everyone involved in the production seemed to accept his unearned authority. When Mendiata and the other sorority girls' time came, they were informed all of a sudden that they would need to be topless for the scene. The script that was sent to Mendiata ahead of the shoot does not include any explicit mention of the sorority extras being topless. And I remember Max specifically yelling that at us, and all of the girls going, what? Because that was not the expectation, said Mendiata. She and the other actors went into the dressing room and emerged topless. I'm trying to face the wall and show my back instead of the crew, and Max is still posted up on his chair and he starts making sexual jokes and just harassing us. I remember he starts making a joke about, like, us dropping our hands and starting a party. That kind of thing. Granted, it was about 12 years ago we're talking about, but I remember him making comments about our breasts and our body. He was doing it in front of everyone and nobody stood up or said anything. And that's when I decided this is not okay. Mendiata and some of the other actors demanded pasties which had not been supplied. This only reinforced Mendiata's impression that the intention going in was just to have a half dozen girls walking around with their boobs out for your enjoyment on this like 90% male set. Eventually they found some tape the women could 
cover themselves with. I'm pretty sure it was duct tape, Mendiata added, because I remember it hurting so much coming off at the end. At one point, I walked by and Max said something, kind of hitting on me. Mendiata continued, can I hug you or come sit on my lap? It was something like that. And at that point, I'd had enough, and still nobody said anything to him, and it just completely soured the experience. I turned around and I told them, I'm out. She said a number of other actors also left before shooting was done. Mendiata's relatively brief interaction with Max Landis stuck with her, and she's since wondered how Landis's behavior may have devolved even further as he accrued more and more power in the entertainment industry. Tasha Goldthriot met Max Landis when she was working as a set costumer on his 2015 future directorial debut, Me, Him, Her, which was filmed in the summer of 2013. This professional role was a newer experience for Goldthwaite, who was in her mid-twenties at the time. The rate was dirt cheap. When she was on set, Goldthwaite learned that she and Landis, the screenwriter and director of the film, had mutual friends in common. Landis quickly began suggesting Goldthwaite to what she described as physical, sexual, and verbal abuse. He would talk about his penis all the time to me brag about the size of it. She continued, on set he would touch me all the time. He would pick me up and turn me upside down and carry me around set. My shirt would come up above my face and I'd be exposed. At one point we were on set with people around and he pushed me down, got on top of me on the bed. I raised my voice and told him to get off me and eventually managed to get him off. Goldthwaite eventually quit. I didn't quit until the last two or three weeks, she said. I'm a very hard worker and I thought I need to stick it through. And then I realized this is not. Of course our business is difficult, but sexual abuse is something else entirely. She recalled telling her boss about the abuse, explaining, I'm fearful to come to work every day. I'm depressed, I'm crying, and I've never felt so isolated. A producer then came to speak with Goldthwaite about her allegation and exit. It was not so usual for the producer to come into the costume trailer to speak with a set costumer, Goldthwaite explained. Even more shockingly, he offered to pay her her rate for the remainder of the shoot, which was very, very odd because the movie had no money. Later, Goldthwaite wait wondered if it was a payoff. In the meeting with the producer and ever since, Goldthwaite has been candid about Landis's behavior and adamant he should be held responsible. I'm not shy to say who it was who assaulted me, Goldthwaite insisted, because I think that needs to be known. And Goldthwaite added, I think I got away lucky because I know that he has taken it so much farther. April Winnie, who worked as a script supervisor alongside Goldthwaite, said that while she feels like I have this image of Tasha being carried upside down due to the amount of time that passed, she can't recall other specific instances. Remembering Max, though, I have zero doubt he did those things, she continued. Especially thinking of the women on that film. I feel bonded to them because we got through it together. I remember those friendships being so powerful because we had this common enemy. Winnie described Landis's behavior through the shoot as abusive and harassment. I will tell you that the list of people that I will never work with again is one person long, and it's him. Bobcat Goldthwaite, the comedian and director, told the Daily Beast that his daughter Tasha informed him about her experience with Landis after he had a chance run in with the screenwriter a few months later. I ran into him and he said, I thought you would hate me. I thought you hated me. And I didn't know what he meant by it. It was a pretty odd thing. And then when she told me about her being assaulted by him, obviously it all made sense. Goldthwaite told her father about some of the behavior, you know, him lifting her up and having her shirt open and him being very very crude constantly around her. The comic continued, My daughter knows the difference between people making a joke and people creating an unsafe and aggressive work environment. He added that, aside from his daughter, he's heard a lot of talk about Landis's behavior. And I don't know why the story never gets broken, and I don't know if he has the ability to crush the story, or his family does, or the people that hire him. It sucks so bad that it's been drawn out like this, Veronica told the Daily Beast. I don't like scrolling through Twitter and seeing his face. It's triggering. It's very panic-inducing, and I know other girls feel the same way. It's hard to be constantly dealing with it, and then to think that nothing is ever going to change. Women like Anna Baker and Julie realize that Landis has a skill for bringing women that he had victimized back into the fold by any means necessary, and insisting that they never leave. One thing I really want people to understand, in whatever way I can, is that you can't see it when you're in it, Baker said. It can be the clearest thing to everyone else, to the friends that you're crying to about the abuse. 
but you can't see it. Baker and Julie only began to see it in full when they compared their stories. Recognizing the pattern of abusive behavior had persisted long after Landis first promised to change, they realized they were not the only ones with power. Not to fix Max, but to warn others. He's not safe. He's never been, Julie wrote in her statement. Protection of other women is my primary motivation, Carrie added. Enough is enough. Whitney Moore tweeted about her experience in result of all these women coming out. A dam has been broken. I never thought I would say anything publicly about things Max Landis did to me because I believe that forgiveness was the correct way to heal. I even defended him for so long because I truly believed he was getting better and that the ways he tortured me was isolated to our relationship. I thought there was no point in sharing the horrific, inhumane things he did to me because publicly condemning someone who's working on themselves is unproductive. Now I I know better that this was a lie. He never got any better. He hid behind his friendship with me and several other good people so he could continue hurting people behind closed doors and not be questioned. Molly McIsaac on Twitter said, here's a conversation I had with Max Landis days after my ex assaulted me, where Max told me that I choose people who abuse me. You should just go offline and spend time in person with real friends and get lots of sleep. I am leaving the city because my ex is out on bail and my life is in danger. I used to rely on Facebook for support when I was unstable, but it's too wild and false a ride and I got addicted to it. I'm going to a safe house in the middle of nowhere. I'm taking my dog books and my Nintendo DS. I'm not going to have friends there. This is just noise to me. I'm sorry. Okay. And also, I'm not sure if you can hear this, but when I said there's something wrong with your selection process, I'm not condoning whatever bad things have happened to you, but I am saying there does seem to be a pattern, and I hope you're learning before something more permanent happens. I don't know why I attract people who hurt me, but I do. You don't attract people who hurt you. You choose them. Okay. My therapist tells me differently. You need a new therapist. Brad Gage also tweeted out in response to this, The biggest shame of my life is knowing that I was friends with Max Landis. Recently, there have been several women to come forward with statements about Max's extreme manipulation and sexual, emotional, and verbal abuse. I urge you to read the statements and believe them, because I know these women, and they're telling the truth. The truths are why I completely cut ties with Max over two years ago. These women's stories are real and honest and should be taken seriously. For me, this is absolutely the most important takeaway. Now that this is all coming to light, it's even clearer to me that everyone deals with shame on their own timeline. For the past two years, I've spent an incredible amount of time wondering how I enabled Max's duplicity. Of course I feel dumb for believing a friend was getting better when he said he was. Of course I feel guilty remembering moments where I should have been more thoroughly checked in with my friend when I could tell he was causing distress. We all want to believe that people closest to us are telling the truth and aren't manipulating us. Now I understand the full magnitude of the abuse. I realized I had assumed that people who did things like this were obviously monsters, easily spotted from miles away. Instead, I see that the most dangerous people. Instead, I see that the most dangerous people are the monsters who know how to act like a good guy sometimes, who know how to be a partner, a co-worker, even a best friend, without you realizing the true nature of who they really are. I know now, waiting for someone to appear as an entirely good guy or entirely a monster can allow manipulation, secrecy, and shame to fester and breed. Trusting that they'll get better when they say they'll get better, or guessing that these women would come forward while such powerful manipulation and abuse was happening, is just plain wrong. It's not how any of this works. Max operated at everyone's blind spot. But the great thing about that is, once you learn your blind spot, he has no power in your life anymore. I don't know what Max's future holds. What I do know is that everyone that has eliminated him from their life has a much brighter future ahead of them. The very fact that he's no longer a part of their story proves that, unlike Max, they actually know how to get better. There's really no good way to transition from such a serious subject to more lighter subjects, so I'll just hop from that onto the next one. A Trump rally went, went on in Orlando, which trended. There's been a lot of political stuff on Twitter lately, and all I have to say on that front is, if you can vote in 2020, make sure you do that. Moving on into more drama territory, Deji decided to show some DMs with his brother in a tweet before deleting it. Deji said in this tweet, I hate being made out to be a liar. First of all, he said we should keep this private for good, but he's still tweeting. And secondly, he's saying I don't want to solve anything, which is far from the truth. We need to sort this out privately. We need to stop making public videos because it's not going to fix anything. So from now on, let's keep this private, please, and sort this out for good. 
If you're having any bad thoughts, you need to just take some time off YouTube and cut off from the internet for a bit. That's what I did, and it helped me a lot. When I see you, I'm going to bring a clinical psychologist with me to help us with this situation. We don't need a psychologist. If you just manned up to your wrongdoings, then we'd be fine. That's all. I can take care of myself. I don't need help with that. All we need is a heart-to-heart, -heart, like I said before. And stop acting like I do not want to fix this. You do this all the time when we message. It pisses me off. We don't need a mediator. We just need to put our egos aside and talk like brothers. What will a mediator do? What's wrong with a mediator? Listen, and quit ignoring what I'm saying. Let's talk in private, me and you. And if it doesn't work, then I'd be happy to have a mediator. If you were really willing to fix this, you'd actually put what I'm saying into consideration. We are currently talking in private, and as you can see, it's not going anywhere. Then, surprisingly enough, Keemstar made a pretty good video covering the drama. You may have beat me to it this time, Keemstar, but I'll be sure to get on the drama next time, dude. Ending on a semi-happier note, hashtag I can't be the only one trended where people put things that, you guessed it, they couldn't really be the only one who thought something. There were a lot of unpopular opinions and it was really interesting to read. I actually really liked seeing that hashtag because I always love reading people's opinions on things, especially when they're different from mine. I'd love to hear yours on any of the topics I covered in this video or trending hashtags I talked about, maybe even what you think you can't be the only one on when it comes to a certain topic. The comment section is your oyster, my friend. Let me know what you think of me starting the series, and if you liked it, it'd be greatly appreciated. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Sending all the good vibes your way. Peace. <laughs>